Okay, so thank you. Uh, we're at the second panel, and then it's all separating, you know, this is the only panel separating uh, you from lunch, so we will uh, hopefully be uh, relatively uh, expeditious. This one is on the question of whether the academy in particular has gotten too formal or too removed in terms of its methods and in terms of what it does uh, for policymakers or, for that matter, the rest of the... Uh, uh, the wide world to understand. And we have a great panel for us. Uh, I am going to introduce uh, everyone. Uh, Mike Desch is uh, not just a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame, he's also the chairman of the Department of Political Science. So please send your respects to him after this panel is over. <laughs> um, he's the author of multiple books, uh, including, um, let's see, Power and Military Effectiveness, The Fallacy of Democratic Triumphalism, from Johns Hopkins University Press. He also, and this is an interesting example that I think goes back to something that Jim said, the, uh, the co-author of a great article that is still not yet out uh, from International Studies Quarterly. It'll be out in the December 2014 issue uh, that polled policymakers to ask them what they value in terms of political science. Uh, the reason I find this amusing is that I believe that article has been talked about since you know the fall of last year. Um, <laughs> And it's still not out yet, which is in some ways, you know, evidence for why would you wait two years to publish something. On the other hand, it's also evidence that just because something's been accepted for publication doesn't mean that you still can't uh, talk about it. And uh, I assume Mike is going to talk a little bit about uh, his findings from that paper. Uh, Mike Horowitz uh, is an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's also an investigator uh, for the Good Judgment Project, uh, which is a project that I think is chaired by uh, Philip Tetlock. Uh, at Berkeley who wrote an outstanding book uh, on expert political judgment uh, that, among other things, includes the fact that academics aren't really that good at being experts. Uh, but uh, he also spent 2013 uh, working for the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, in the Department of Defense as an International Affairs Fellow, which is sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations, and is the author of The Diffusion of Military Power, Causes and Consequences for International Politics, which won the Best Book Award from the International Security Studies section of the ISA, uh, and the Furness Award from the Mearshon Center at The Ohio State University. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Zainab Tufekci, um, who is an assistant professor uh, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in the School of Information and Library Sciences, uh, with an affiliate appointment at the Department of Sociology. Uh, she's also a fellow at the Berkman Center, uh, here in the Boston area uh, at Harvard University, and was previously an assistant professor of sociology at the University of uh, Maryland at Baltimore. But far more important than any of that are two important things. Uh, the first is, is that many people talk to Zainab uh, and say, are you at Zainab, rather than are you Zainab, uh, which is to say uh, Zainab's uh, Twitter profile is, is rather extraordinary uh, because her substantive work is on, among other things, uh, the use of social media in, in protest. And far and away, the most important fact about Zainab and why you should listen to her is that she gave up a fully funded four-day boondoggle in Tuscany to come to this conference. I did. I did. So you know, a round of applause, please, for the opportunity cost and sacrifice. Here. Thank you. And, and I, I, as a result, I will go down to you and... Right, yeah, I was saying, I will come down to UNC Truffle Chapel Hill. season, I know. I will go down to UNC Chapel Hill. I will lecture about whatever the hell you want me to lecture as a result of that. Uh, but with that, uh, I will start with Mike. Uh, everyone's got about 15 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have a lively conversation. Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Dan, for that kind introduction. Uh, my co-author, Paul Avey, is here, uh, and my usual MO when he's not here is to blame him for everything that's uh, wrong with the piece. But when he's here, I'm con contractually obligated to say everything that's wrong with the piece is my fault. Every brilliant insight is his. Secondly, I want to attest that Paul loves methods, especially quantitative methods. Uh, and uh, so he doesn't endorse any of the more heterodox findings of the, uh, of the piece. Um, and speaking of uh, heterodox, uh, I, my role on this panel is, uh, I think, to uh, uh, give voice to the straw man. So I'm going to make some remarks uh, under the melodious title of Technique Trump's Relevance, Why National Security Policymakers Find Academic Social Science Less Than Helpful. And I think there's lots of evidence uh, on behalf of that proposition, uh, that there's a growing gap uh, between what we do in the ivory tower as IR slash uh, security specialists uh, and what the policymakers in Washington are looking for. 
Robert. Joe Nye had that uh, famous uh, scholars on the sidelines, uh, WAPO op-ed piece, which uh, made the case from an impressionistic standpoint. Uh, Paul and I did a survey of uh, almost uh, 240 uh, current and senior high-level national security decision makers and think we found more systematic uh, evidence for that. So it seems to me the fact is uh, reasonably clear. Reasonable people, uh, not saying I'm a reasonable person, but... Uh, no one would say yeah, that. Yeah, I play, I play one on TV. Uh, might argue about uh, why that's the case. And I guess I uh, endorse uh, a large element of the John Mearsheimer professionalization of academic social science uh, argument about why this is the case. And I find it compelling for both logical and empirical reasons. Logically, it seems to me that there's good reason to think that the process of what Thomas Kuhn calls normal science would lead to scholarly work that's both narrower in focus, sometimes so narrow uh, as to be uh, uh, unintelligible to uh, other people even in the same discipline, but also work that's uh, increasingly driven by internal disciplinary uh, criteria rather than what the National Science Foundation calls uh, the work's broader relevance. Uh, in other words, the professionalization of uh, political science uh, has led to a situation, I would argue, uh, in which research in the academy in the field of national security studies, academic national security studies, is increasingly methods driven rather than problem driven. Uh, and for me, that's a good thumbnail explanation for the gap. Now, it seems to me there's a lot of evidence that uh, that, in fact, is what's happening. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Siegelman uh, essay in the centennial issue of APSA, which uh, actually is quite um, uh, compatible with the uh, uh, TRIPS findings uh, on the uh, whole question of the decreasing salience uh, of policy recommendations. And there's another figure in the Siegelman piece that if you take uh, the measure of uh, policy relevance and transpose it on the rise uh, of uh, quantitative and formal theory. I haven't calculated the correlation between the two, but I'm guessing the, via an interocular uh, test, uh, it's a, a pretty perfect uh, inverse correlation. Um, now, uh, so, and this is actually a broader trend. There's a, a, a shelf load of books uh, about other social scientists, uh, social sciences that are basically making uh, the same point. As those disciplines become more professionalized, they become narrower and uh, uh, more inward looking. Now, the argument I want to make, though, and here I'm stepping away from my role as the uh, honorary straw man of the conference is, uh, I wouldn't argue, and we don't argue in the paper, that it's simply the result uh, of the increasing quantification of our discipline. And in fact, I think uh, there's, uh, we're a bit too cavalier to throw around the uh, rigor versus relevance uh, criteria uh, as sort of the framing issues of this debate. And in fact, what I want to argue is the problem is uh, not so much rigor versus relevance, but rather an increasingly narrow definition uh, of, lit, uh, of rigor uh, defined uh, largely in terms of technique that's come to dominate uh, professional social science. And I was going to give you a lot of evidence of this, but the previous panel uh, already cited the method de jour. Uh, field experiments um, and, uh, you know, the effect that that has on uh, recruiting, I think, uh, illustrates the, uh, the process. We're very much a technique-driven discipline. Um, and this focus on technique, uh, rather than a broader and more Catholic definition of policy relevance, I think raises two problems uh, for the larger enterprise we're here talking about. One is, if we're wound around the axle about technique as the defining element of uh, what the scholarly approach is, then this narrows the range uh, of problems that we can address, unless you want to defend the proposition 
that every policy problem is amenable to the technique de jure, whether it was formal theory in the 1990s, uh, you know, large and quantitative uh, analysis uh, as it has been uh, for a lot of the uh, recent period, or field experiments, which, by the way, aren't new, uh, had their heyday uh, in social psychology uh, in the 1960s. Um, and secondly, if we, if we become locked into trying to apply these techniques to every problem, uh, with that, without asking whether the techniques are actually appropriate to the problem in the data that we have, uh, it's going to undermine our credibility uh, in the policy world. So uh, two basic points here. One is uh, we get locked into techniques. It narrows uh, the area of policy issues that we can talk about. Uh, and secondly, uh, if we get locked into a technique, it can also create a uh, law of the instrument sort of uh, phenomenon where we try to apply inappropriate techniques uh, to problems they don't really work for. Now, I've got about seven minutes left, so I want to uh, talk about uh, my subfield of academic national security studies as a cautionary tale. Uh, about these dynamics. And, and I want to begin by uh, pointing out that uh, there's a widespread view uh, in the field of international relations that national security studies, and I'm using Bernard Brody's famous phrase uh, from the late 1940s, is something of a retarded science. Um, and you can find, you know, more recent manifestations of that same sentiment, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, in the mid-1990s, David Baldwin had a much-discussed piece in world politics in which he argued that security studies was dead because it was locked into uh, one paradigm, uh, realism, um, and uh, so it wasn't theoretically innovative. Uh, and there also have been uh, recurrent critiques uh, of the field of academic national security studies suggesting that it's also not methodologically innovative, that everybody does qualitative historical uh, work and uh, that's not the cutting edge. So that's the, uh, the view, uh, but I think that view is a prejudice. And I think if you uh, go back and look at the history of the field of national security studies, a very different picture emerges. First of all, to say that the field has been atheoretical or locked into only one theory, and this has made it uh, intellectually unproductive, uh, strikes me as uh, not a sustainable argument. Uh, rational deterrence theory is only one of a number of important theories that came out of the field um, and have uh, demonstrated their usefulness uh, over time uh, to the larger discipline. And secondly, the idea that national security studies uh, is somehow antithetical to uh, cutting edge methods of social science, again ignores the fact that the, uh, the field emerged in the early Cold War uh, at a time in which, uh, you know, uh, uh, approaches such as operations research, econometrics, and game theory were in their infancy. Um, and uh, uh, especially uh, national security uh, people, both in the academy and especially at RAND, played a very important role in the perfection and development uh, of these very important uh, tools of social science analysis. And indeed, one of the founding fathers uh, of national security studies, uh, Thomas Schelling, uh, received the uh, economics version of the, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, work that he did uh, during this period. So, you know, the notion that uh, the field has not uh, been either theoretically fertile uh, or methodologically innovative uh, doesn't seem to me to be sustainable. But there is a big difference between the way security studies has thought about these two issues and the way the rest of the discipline of political science uh, has engaged with them that's worth uh, reflecting on. One is security studies has been very much been problem rather than method or theory driven. Uh, and so operations research, game theory, and econometrics uh, were all embraced and perfected to deal with 
practical problems rather than uh, you know, for uh, their own purposes. Secondly, security studies has been interdisciplinary almost from its inception. You know, uh, Schelling was, of course, an economist. Um, but at the time when uh, early national security studies uh, was characterized uh, by uh, very uh, uh, cutting edge and uh, complex uh, social scientific tools uh, of the sort that economists were developing, uh, it also embraced and employed uh, very humanistic approaches uh, to uh, studying social phenomenon. And the big area here, which uh, we talked a little bit about in the last panel, was area studies. So in other words, during uh, security studies golden age, uh, it was an analytically eclectic and problem-focused field. And I think this was really the core to its uh, early uh, or its uh, policy relevance. Now, two things have happened, I think, that have uh, exacerbated the gap between policy relevant uh, security studies and the rest of the discipline of political science. Uh, the first is, is that given that we have a, a utilitarian or pragmatic uh, attitude towards tools and techniques, uh, we're happy to give them up uh, once they uh, don't work. And in fact, uh, if you read uh, the terrific chapter in Mark Trachtenberg's book, uh, History and Strategy, about the dead end uh, in uh, nuclear theory uh, in the early 1960s, uh, what he makes clear is that uh, the field uh, took uh, these uh, tools as far as they would take us in the concrete problems uh, of understanding the effect of uh, nuclear weapons on statecraft. Uh, and once we hit, hit this uh, theoretical and methodological dead end, uh, we were happy to move on in other directions. Now this coincided though with exactly the time when the rest of the discipline of political science was riding the quest, uh, crest of the wave of the behavioral revolution. Uh, and so we seem to be uh, not two ships passing in the night, but actually uh, sailing in different directions. And then secondly, at about this same time, area studies, uh, which if you look at the results of our survey or you just listen to uh, uh, Aaron's comments, for example, remain quite uh, relevant in terms of what policymakers find useful from work that's being done in the academy. Um, but I'm here to tell you that within the discipline of, uh, of political science, area studies is well, maybe not extinct. It's certainly uh, going the way uh, of the uh, dodo bird. So my bottom line is I think we need to reframe this debate a little bit. I wouldn't talk about rigor or relevance uh, because there's no doubt that uh, methodologically uh, very sophisticated work can be policy relevant. It was uh, at an early stage um, in the... Uh, uh, you know, the formative period of uh, national security studies in the uh, early Cold War, um, and there are examples of very sophisticated uh, social science work uh, that remains relevant today, including uh, in the field of security studies. So it's not rigor versus relevance, rigor being defined in terms of math or the use of quantitative methods. I think the way we ought to be thinking about this is uh, rather to reframe rigor in terms of appropriate rigor and ask, are we answering questions that the rest of the world cares about and then using the most rigorous tools uh, appropriate to that question? And I think when we do that, irrespective of what the actual technique is, uh, that policymakers will be eager to hear what we have to say. Um, and will be uh, more relevant to their broader concerns. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, good start. Michael, the floor uh, is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, obviously, since uh, I'm here, although I did not pass up a trip to Tuscany, uh, <laughs> I think that these are, are hugely important questions. And I was very encouraged by what, by what Mike said in, in some ways, because I was going to lead off by saying that I think that, that conflicts about methods don't really get us anywhere that we need to move beyond these discussions about is more policy relevant work quantitative or qualitative or formal or whatever, 
and think about how to actually incentivize and encourage real world policy relevant research regardless of method. In some ways, it's time to stop talking about policy relevance and actually do uh, policy relevance. And I think part of that gets to, in some ways, thinking about what we actually mean by policy relevance, because I think the policy world is very different than we sometimes imagine. And when you read op-eds about this, or, or hear people like us sort of talk at conferences about it, there's, a, uh, there's this kind of unitary notion of, of what policy relevance means. And when academics talk about policy relevance, they tend to imagine this, this magical world where they write a memo or a brief, and it ends up on the desk of the President of the United States and magically changes American foreign policy toward Iran or toward Syria or, to, or toward something. But if that is what policy relevance means, then 99.9% .9 of the people who work for the US government are not policy relevant. <laughs> That's just not a realistic definition of what policy relevance means. And I think what this in some ways betrays, and, and maybe this, you know, in, in, in Mike, I think, had a very useful uh, history lesson about the way that the field of security studies has engaged with the, the policy world. I think what it betrays in some ways is almost a Kennan-esque Office of Policy Planning grand strategy bias towards what counts as policy relevant research. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> and as someone who participates in that. But, uh, but I think that the world of policy relevance, as I'll, as I'll, as I'll talk about in a second, is much, uh, is much broader than that. In that, you know, as all of us know, nearly all real world foreign policy decisions are made on the basis of a complicated bureaucratic process with lots of different stakeholders. And there are very rarely actual fundamental final decisions. They're just a series of arguments happening often over and over and over and over uh, again. And so trying to figure out who influenced something is often very difficult to figure out years after the fact. I mean, in, in some ways, that's what diplomatic and military history are, are, are supposed to do, is, is tell us sort of decades later when everything's declassified, you know, what were actually the relevant things that you know, drove uh, a sort of policy uh, outcome. And so I think there's a tendency to romanticize some kind of past period where academics had you know, lots of policy influence and you know, a, a crusty old Harvard professor could call up his old friend from Andover you know, in the State Department, and you know, and that, you know, and that's how, you know, and then that's how insert something about the Cold War happened. <laughs> and but what, so, what can academics control? What do I think policy relevance actually is? What I think policy relevance is is being engaged in, and again, to, to second what Mike said, real-world policy relevant questions. And within that, I think that there are lots of ways that academics can end up shaping those kinds of discussions. One way that academics can shape discussions is by, by helping shape prior to a crisis breaks out. And this gets to, I, I think, in some ways what, what Aaron or someone else said on the previous panel about how it's useful, actually, to have academics who are studying Ukraine even when there's nothing going on, even when Ukraine's not a big deal. Because in some ways, what those people are doing is setting the table for what are the options that people are going to talk about when the Ukraine kind of crisis happens. So I think there's a table-setting function. There's also a an argument-making function in, in talking about the different options that are on the table in any particular policy debate and in, in shaping how people think about what the pros and cons of those options, you know, what the pros and cons of those options actually are. And then especially, and this in some ways brings it, you know, starts to bring it into the, the formality question, especially in thinking about what the actual base rates are and that I think one of the most valuable functions that academic research can serve, and this goes to one of the things Peter said, is laying out what the central tendency is, defining what the central tendency is to a, a policymaker. And that, I think, is something that can be very relevant, even though in any individual case, what the policymaker is trying to do, again, is figure out, does this case fit the overall model? And of course it doesn't because no case is ever exactly sort of fits uh, a, a particular model uh, of the world. But I think that by thinking about it that way, it creates a space where we can do, I think, a lot more work that, that's sort of actually, uh, actually relevant. And part of that goes to the, the translation function, to get back to you know, the, the, what was said sort of you know, you know, a, a lot earlier today. By the translation function, I mean 
not just writing the academic journal article, but writing the, you know, the academic journal article, and then maybe the foreign affairs or foreign policy piece, and then maybe the, the blog post, or maybe, you know, seeing if, you know, Dan will tweet about it uh, or something. And the, in that there are lots of different ways that we can engage. And I think that when we think about policy relevance, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll pick on the TRIP survey here uh, in some ways because I, I think, as Mike knows, I'm a huge, huge fan uh, of, the, of the project and think it's doing really important work. Thinking about policy relevance as policy prescription, I, I think is not, is not necessarily the, the most helpful thing because that, that's not necessarily the best role that academics have to serve. And that in some ways you can imagine what's happening in academic journal articles, even when they're really esoteric, as laying, as having these arguments within academia that then in, in, in theory in a, in a productive discipline that lead to resolutions about those arguments and then the kinds of recommendations that people can give to policymakers about what base rates are, about what particular central tendencies are in given areas. And so that kind of, I mean, to, to, then, to again misuse sort of basic and applied research, that kind of basic research, that kind, those kinds of debates in, in academic journals, even those are serving a productive purpose because they're advancing, they're advancing how we think about, about particular issues. And I think if you think about policy relevant research as just research on important real world questions, or you think about it as political scientists engaged in the real world, I actually think that policy relevant work is increasing rather than decreasing. I'll say that again. I think it's increasing rather than decreasing. I think that there's still a lot more to do, I think, but I think that the trends are in the right direction. But I think that only becomes clear when you break out of the methodological divides and when you break out of the isms debate, when you break apart the sort of holy trinity of security studies equals realist equals qualitative case studies. It's only when you break out of that and look at the broader world that you see that there's a whole lot more policy relevant research by political scientists going on. I think one sort of anecdotal bit of evidence of this is look at what hiring and promotion have looked like. People that are really successful in the discipline. People like say uh, Jay Lyle or Jake Shapiro or Sarah Kreps. Uh, people who are doing, who, who go to Washington, D.C., who talk about their research, and even though they wouldn't necessarily come up in a list of who we would think about as sort of policy-relevant scholars, because they're doing lots of quantitative work, and sometimes, and sometimes formal work, but they spend a lot more time in the Department of Defense and at the Department of State than a lot of people that think of themselves as, as sort of policy-relevant. I think you see this in American politics as well. Uh, Dan Hopkins who's uh, a professor at Georgetown, whose uh, academic research is, it even make, makes my head hurt uh, sometimes uh, reading it. Uh, he had uh, one of the first blog posts on 538, Nate Silver's new blog, looking, at, looking at, at, at gubernatorial, I think, elections. How is that not policy relevant in a way? That's, the, that's an academic then serving the translation function, which I think is really uh, valuable. And I mean, and in some ways, the, the story of the explosion of randomized controlled experiments in political campaigns is a, is a story of, of uh, it's a triumph for academic policy relevance. It's an example of, in some ways, Gerber and Green and, 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 and Rick Perry basically letting them do some experiments and how that's now become a, a really important way that people think about how to do political campaigns uh, right. And that's, I think, another example uh, of kind of academic uh, of kind of academic policy relevance. And those things don't necessarily show up in something like the TRIP survey, which is okay because you, you can, the, the TRIP survey can't do uh, uh, everything, but I think it's certainly uh, important. And so at the end of the day, I think that criticizing academic journal articles for being too quantitative or formal is mostly a, a, a red herring. It's not like we critique nature or science for not being policy relevant. but what people who write in nature and science often do when their work has some relevance for policy is then they take that work and they translate it into something that's accessible for the policy community and then they go brief it to the policy community. And I think about what academics should be doing in a very similar way. In that I don't think that our jobs are so hard that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. That we can't do both serious, rigorous scholarship on real world issues and write about it in a way that's accessible uh, for the real world. And, and I think if we can learn and accept that walking and chewing gum at the same time 
is, is actually a pretty good thing. And I think a lot of people uh, in this room are, are really great uh, examples of that and have been role models to me. Then I think that's a productive way that we can start moving forward with what I would say is real world policy relevance uh, over time. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay, uh, great. I like that clarion call. Um, Zainab, floor is yours. Well, um, I was expecting to argue more, but I'm finding myself agreeing a lot, so I'll just go from there. See, I'm, I'm an academic who really strongly believes in the chew and, you know, walk at the same time um, argument. Uh, you know, because I'm a blogger, I tweet, I do all those things, Well, sometimes people think that I don't think academia is valuable, and that's why I'm doing it. It's absolutely the opposite. Uh, I think there's a lot we bring to the table as academics, and sometimes I think we get overly defensive about the value we bring to the table, and I'm gonna try to talk about it a little bit. Now, I hear the sort of methodological fetishism as a problem, and that's obviously absolutely true if you get stuck on one method and if you're just hiring people from that method. But focusing on a method and going deep in it and developing it, and even sometimes to the point of extreme, is one of the valuable things we do. I mean, it's a good thing to be able to have a space in which where we focus on, say, a method and we work through it, and when you're working through something, not everything you're trying out is going to be great. Uh, the problem might be when it becomes the sole focus, but you know, experimental field studies, they're just great results coming out of it that I don't think you can get any other way. And the fact that it's become somewhat of a fad, I'm kind of happy. Let it be a bit <laughs> of a fad for a while. We don't have enough of it. It's not just you know, the sort of the Gerber and Greens, the um, right. Yale political science stuff. There's amazing work coming out of MIT on uh, poor people's decision making under great yeah. stress and constraints. It's amazing work and you cannot get that by asking people because like academics, like other people, poor people, middle class people, other people, people don't really have the full sense of their decision making process. Just to, you know, it, it's not because they're poor, it's because they're people, right? We're not fully rationally aware of um, how exactly we make those decisions. It's a lot better than some other methods have been, which is either just talking to them or surveying them, which I do surveys, but sometimes it's not the best method for those things. So I'm, so I'm gonna defend, you know, the way we sometimes focus on methods, yes, let's not get carried out, but it has a function itself. Yes, let's not just hire, you know, field uh, researchers. Even the disciplinary divisions to me are a bigger problem. I mean, the behavioral economists discover social psychology and boom, it's a new field. There's a lot more to be gained by, you know, let's have a conversation <laughs> across fields. And that's why I think this kind of things we do in terms of blogging, tweeting, social media, that's, that's a uh, future panel. It's great because I do something and there's other people in other fields who know about it, they tell me about it, which has just been amazing uh, for the methods. So I, I'm gonna defend, you know, let's get lost in methods a bit more than the rest of the world. And also, um, the world of what's called considered policy relevant can be so quantitatively illiterate sometimes that I think we forget the value of bringing some of these rigorous points to the table. I mean, um, I can give example after example from mass media where, you know, somebody can't even distinguish the average versus the mode and what does this mean, uh, and write a whole article and you can go viral like that too. It's not, um, so we do bring a rigor. We need to explain what we're doing without getting, again, you know, sort of scientistic, I call it sometimes, just mm -hmm. the numbers don't by themselves are magic, but rigorous numbers are very powerful. Um, so that's the other one thing. For um, multi-method, now after defending getting lost in methods, I think multi-method is obviously such the, is the strong point. It's if you just do one kind of method, uh, you're going to miss things, you're gonna be misguided. I was just, you know, I, 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 on one hand, for example, the rise of big data, I'm really excited in some ways. I'm a social scientist, I'm a former technical person, the amount of data available, you know, the kind of data that previous generations would probably sell their first and second children for is just right there uh, at the uh, uh, IPI. On the other hand, there's real weaknesses to it, and you can only get at some of those weaknesses if you're doing qualitative work. I was doing Gezi protest research. I do social media and social movements. I was doing interviews on the ground there, and I got a chance to look at the big data side of it, and you know, there's so many hashtag studies now, and they get published everywhere, 
And I was on the ground, and I noticed nobody was using hashtags. I was asking people, why? Well, the topic is obvious. Why would we use them? So if you look at the hashtag big data study, it looked like the protests had died down. If you were there, you were getting tear gas, and there were lots of people around. So it was kind of this mismatch between levels of data can really be explored best with multi-method. So let's go deep in methods. Let's go be, be multi-method. That um, seems very important. And in terms of the policy relevance, I'm really... I think once we get to, once we learn to speak uh, excessively, the policy relevance kind of makes a case for itself. Uh, I, I published a little blog post on Medium, uh, basically explaining we're having this conversation with the students yesterday at dinner, uh, applying uh, ah, third week of introduction to sociology, which I used to teach on different kinds of social networks and their affordances to social media platforms where Facebook fits, where Snapchat fits, where everything fit. And Silicon Valley people were like, oh, you're brilliant. I'm like, no, this is the third chapter of an introduction to sociology book. And it's not really you know, my particular brilliance. All I've done is done this, you know, writing it in a thousand words. I find this again and again. We had this, uh, in my area of research, we had the USAID apparently decided to fund a fake social network for Cuba without thinking through what would happen if they succeeded. You know, the Cubans using a US funded network, if it succeeds, oops. Or thinking through what if it fails and it gets found out, oops, talking point for every you know, authoritarian out there. And I, I wrote a piece about it and basically bringing in my own research and bringing in what I know about how that works and I swear, we, I, we could have told people that in a very policy relevant way why that was not a good idea. So I'm just sort of resisting the I, that I kind of sort of this overly defensiveness about our policy relevance. I think policy itself is not always policy relevant. It's not always good policy. <laughs> the fact that we're not making strides sometimes is because we're telling things that there are a lot of interests don't want to hear. Uh, I get calls almost every week nowadays um, from a Beltway company that wants to sell a contract to say DARPA or Department of Defense or something that are funding a lot of social media related research. And I keep shooting down the ideas. They're not gonna work. You know, people come up with schemes that I don't think are plausible by a large shot. And they're like, would you like to be a consultant on it? And I'm like, no, because it's not gonna work. And then I don't get a call back from that firm again until the next time. So why is my work there not policy relevant? Well, because it's not feeding into the boondoggle economy the way some of the contractors would like. Now, I'm not gonna give up and become policy relevant by saying what happens to be the fad du jour in the policy world. The policy world has its fads. Big data is a fad, social media is a fad. Now, these are my research areas, but they're also fads at the moment. I'm well aware of that. So maybe having academia as a place where I pay my rent and not have to play the sort of the policy fad game, I think strengthens my policy relevance in that I have this freedom of speech to go where my research takes me and to speak freely. So yes, you know, being policy relevant can be great, but then you're playing you know, in the academy, we play the how do I get published in the top journal world. That doesn't mean there are no games in the policy world. That might not be great for, say, the politics and the civic in general, uh, even if people are telling us, oh, no, you're not policy relevant. Well, maybe we're telling, you know, maybe we need to be there and not be as policy relevant. So um, all of these, um, it, I don't want to also sound like that, None of the criticisms are true. I think they are, but I think having a space that is not driven by sort of the previous panel talked about the problem of the day, that is not bound by how do I get the next contract, that is not bound by um, sort of two lack of rigorous methods, let's say, brings the academy in this very interesting special place where we can go deep, and we can speak up in ways that might not be as popular, and that might not take, uh, might be as well received, but over a longer term, a lot of times we see people come back and say, wait, this was a point, and there was a point, and you see this in uh, big questions, you know, wars, foreign policy, you see this in small questions. Um, I see this very much in my own field, internet freedom was a major policy 
um, topic for a while, and a lot of things that we are finding in our research were very important uh, to what later happened. So overall, I'm going to argue for, you know, let's critically examine ourselves. Not, not, let's not get focused on a single study, I mean, single method for too long. Let's not, you know, just focus on this top journal publishing cycle, which it takes so many years. Let us blog, let us tweet. But let us not give up all the things that the academy has that the other fields don't have that we bring to the table. And I don't really see anybody else bringing to the table. The NGOs are also facing, they're chasing the foundations. They're chasing other fads. You know, so this kind of the tenure and the departments, all the protections we have, I think strengthen what we can do. So instead of kind of going, becoming more and more defensive, let's think about how do we use our strengths to insert ourselves to this dialogue, but not necessarily in a way that's looking to please the policymakers, but sometimes to challenge them, uh, because I think that's something that that is done less and less and less given the political and civic and funding climate out there. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. That was uh, fantastic. So uh, three really interesting talks. Uh, I've got questions, but I'm going to hold off mine at the end to see if some of you were smart enough to actually ask them for me. <laughs> so, or at least, you know, pressure enough to ask them for me. So any questions from the audience? Oh, good, a student. Sarah, wait until the mic is there and then introduce yourself, please. Hi, Sarah Detzner, first year PhD here at Fletcher. Um, I was hoping to ask, uh, this touches on a couple of the talks, I think, but uh, particularly your two. Um, in the effort to walk and chew gum at the same time, I guess uh, this might sound a little depressing, but how much confidence do you have that rigor policymakers either want to or can discern solid data from nonsense? Well, that's a different question. <laughs> yeah, there's two questions. Yeah, there. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are two things there. One is, I, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, I think it depends on how you present it. And so, so I spent last year, uh, as, as Dan mentioned, you know, working in the Department of Defense, and there were zero times that I showed my boss a regression table and said, you know, thus we should be doing this. But there were several times where I described academic research that used, used data and said, you know, thus this is the expectation that we should be departing from when thinking about this particular instance about, you know, how like Iran might behave or how China might behave or something like that. And I found, I, I found the, the people that I was working with in the Defense Department receptive when you, when you I mean, as, my, uh, as, as somebody might say in, in church, when you put the hay where the goats can get it, uh, they're a lot more likely to get fed. And I think that's, uh, and, and I think that, Goes Where's the to, randomized control trial for that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Pretty sure that one worked, actually. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them. But I, I think, so I think it's about presenting, the informa presenting information in a way that's accessible. But of course, like, whether they really take it or not might depend on their own biases and their own, like, all sorts of things you can't control. Right. So um, not always. They're not going to always listen to you. But that's exactly what you can do. What you can do is sort of go on and on and, you know, speak and blog and interview on what the data shows, uh, and the policymakers have their own biases, they have constituencies, they have elections. I think your question shows that policy relevance shouldn't be fetishized at the expense of truth relevance, right? And sort of yeah. pushing for what really works. That's and great. yes, you are not always going to be heard, but that's all the more reason to find more ways to speak up. Um, Jim? Thanks. Jim Goldgeier from American University. So I um, get your thoughts on, on the issue that's been raised, not only in this panel, but the previous one about the importance of, um, of the research question. Uh, and asking important research questions and uh, questions that, you know, the answers to which are going to help policymakers solve problems. Uh, because one of the challenges is not just thinking about sort of important questions today, but what are going to be important questions down the road? Uh, you know, what are the important questions five years from now? If you start a research project now, coming up with the answers would be really helpful. One of the things that we've done 
in our Bridging the Gap project, our newer foreign policy conference every spring for PhD students, and we've had great uh, Fletcher PhD students uh, come to that over the years, so I hope that'll continue, um, is we've used scenario-based analyses uh, not to, you know, try to make predictions about things, but just to try to think through about the drivers of world politics in the coming years and what kinds of questions flow from that uh, in order to really get people thinking about forward-looking uh, questions uh, that, you know, if they get the research done will be really important. I just wanted to get your thoughts about the process of coming up with a research question because I find certainly you know, always when I talk to students, I always tell them that's the hardest thing uh, about a project is coming up with a good question. Uh, the rest really has to, you know, the rest flows from that. I think the graduate students are always the great truth tellers in terms, they're like the canary in the coal mine in terms of the state of the discipline. And it's interesting to talk to graduate students uh, who are especially in the early stages of their graduate career about how they think about some of these issues. Uh, and I agree, it's not all you know, gloom and doom. On the other hand, I, I guess I'll push back a little bit against Zainab. I, I think to fundamentally ignore the fact that uh, there, there are some powerful uh, organizational pathologies within our business oh, yeah. uh, that make uh, doing uh, policy relevant work difficult uh, is very important for us to uh, to recognize uh, and the idea you know you just uh, think about uh, you know what what are graduate students uh, socialized in they're socialized in the defining feature uh, of being a political scientist is a, a particular set of techniques. Now, it didn't always used to be that way. You know, it used to be uh, at one time a set of, uh, you know, uh, real world questions that organized the discipline. But I think increasingly uh, it's not that. Secondly, and, and again, I'm maybe speaking a, a little bit out of school because I'm an academic bureaucrat. Uh, so, you know, I'm sort of in the, uh, the belly of the beast. but. Uh, as political science departments, including my own, have gotten smaller, uh, and as we've become more attuned to uh, rankings, especially the NRC rankings, the idea that uh, somebody would apply to our program, even a very good student who would confess any doubt that what they wanted to do was to be an academic and to publish academic journals, they're spulos verjunken, as they used to say of the, uh, the U-boats. Uh, we, we won't uh, admit them. Um, and I don't think that we're atypical. In fact, I think most R1 departments with graduate programs, uh, if you do policy relevant work, uh, you're doing it, uh, especially as an untenured faculty member, on the QT. Uh, and God help you if you're a graduate student uh, and you confess at some point to say, you know, maybe I'd like an applied position uh, rather than a, uh, a practical position. So, you know, I mean, there are people like Michael uh, and there are people like Jason Lyle and Jacob Shapiro and a number of other people who have managed to swim against the current. Uh, and that's terrific. You know, God bless them that they can do it. But the current is flowing in the other direction uh, and it's incumbent on us to recognize that, uh, you know, that this is a reality. And to the extent that we complain or policymakers complain that a lot of what we do doesn't have much to do with the price of tea in China, we've got to look in our own house. Tina? Well, what you s describe really does sound awful, so I'm just not going to uh, push back against it in the sense that... Um, awful or right? Awful in the sense that if they, people are being discouraged just because their work is policy relevant, that seems really misguided on the, um, in terms of the discipline. Uh, where I'm looking from, and maybe it's because I'm not in a political science department, is the trend is completely the other way from where I'm looking at, and maybe this is a school by school or discipline by discipline. I mean, from the very beginning of my academic career where my work wasn't really that well understood within my disciplines, I got great encouragement from my deans, my provosts, my university presidents. Um, just they kind of picked me and they were like, keep on doing it and we're going to do what we can to help you and to protect you. 
so that helped me kind of explore the policy relevant side of my work rather than sort of doing the only journal article publishing with a three year lag cycle. All I can say is I wish more of that happened and maybe it's on us to protect our grad students who are on that path. And then when we become tenured, I'm not yet tenured, so everything I say should be taken with a grain of salt, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, when we become tenured, we should push back too because the academy, yes, it has its pathologies to say the least, but tenured faculty, you know, we do kind of run the place to a degree under great constraints and stress. So it can be changed. Uh, just very quickly, I think that the uh, I, I think that the, some of the trends that Mike's identified, some of those pressures are, are, are certainly true, but uh, like in general, how I, I think I tend to be just a little more optimistic than Mike uh, about the field. I think that they're uh, better than they were 10 or 15 years ago in terms of the incentives to not do policy relevant uh, research as long as you can, again, sort of walk and chew gum at the same time. I just wanted to give a, my, my practical answer to, to Jim Goldgeier's question, which is uh, what I call it, it's my dissertation two by two which is that uh, dissertations can either be the topic can be old or new, and the argument can be old or new. Uh, what you don't want uh, is to be, They you both know, can't be old. Yeah, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to be in, old, in the old, old box. So a realist explanation for World War I as your dissertation is not a good idea. <laughs> and most dissertations are on the off-diagonal. It's basically like an old theory about a new thing or a new theory about an old thing. And then the most sort of cutting edge things, the highest risk things are the things in the new new box because you're basically trying to generate the market for why, why what you're doing is, uh, is, is interesting. When you, when you can do that, then there's an enormous payoff to it. But, but that's how I've that's thought about, risky. that's how I think about framing these things, for, for my students at least. I would also I would just add here before we go to the questions, I, I do think the thing has changed, at least in my own academic career, because I think when I started out, I'd agree with Mike, the idea that you were trying to you know, publish in policy relevant venues or what have you, that was almost always seen as a negative and something you had to wait until you had tenure and then you could potentially do. And to be fair to Mike, I do hear that every once in a while still. I'm not saying it's disappeared. But I would say what's happened now is, is that if someone is seen as publishing sufficiently in what we would consider sort of the peer reviewed mm -hmm. work, then publishing outside of that is seen as an un unalloyed good, yeah. as an unambiguous positive. Um, in a way that I don't think was true 15 years ago. If, on the other hand, you don't publish enough in those venues, yeah. I do that's, think that's the negative thing, the, yeah. the negative uh, problem right, still right. I mean, that's absolutely right. And I want to add, the big problem there is the day is the 24 hours problem. Yeah. Yeah. So it's absolutely <laughs> encouraged. As long, if you're, I mean, I'm publishing at a, you know, exactly what I should be publishing peer-reviewed wise, and I'm clearing the bar. And if I weren't, I would be in trouble academically because it's the academy. I'm not a pundit yeah. columnist. Yeah. PhD programs. PhD programs. Being at Fletcher, the answer is obviously yes, because that's, I mean, right. th and this is the distinction between the public policy school versus a, a discipline. So. School of Information I'm at, yes. Woodrow Wilson School, where I was at last year, yes. Absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't. And I'm perfectly okay with that, because our PhD program is very small, and we, our PhD program is very small, and, and I would tell those students, you know, those, those sort of applicants, we tend to not attract a lot of those applicants. But the same thing that I tell my students when they come to me and they want to get a PhD, they want to spend like six years getting yeah. an American style PhD, but they don't want to be a professor, which is why. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that the MA is good for or MS is good for in the policy world that, you know, getting lost in a small question for six or seven years of your life on poverty wages might not be the best option for this person to begin with. In some ways, this goes to the point, I think, that the concern you always have in the academy is do we wind up gravitating towards corner solutions, um, which is does everyone do the exact same thing? And this, you know, this goes to the nature of being fads or not. I don't disagree with anything that's been said here. It's a question of whether you can have people simultaneously doing the sort of, you know, the, the sort of, you know, method, methods-driven work that you were talking about, Zainab, but at the same time, you can also still have other people doing the kind of work that Mike's talking about, and they don't, you know, try to kill each other. Uh, it was a question. You want pluralism. Yeah, yeah. But the question, we never necessarily think about it that way because we're always yeah. fearing that the trend is going towards yeah, one end or the other. Pluralism and it winds up swamping. Pluralism is the solution. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I've been stepping on the student who has a question, so go ahead. That's okay. Uh, my and who name, are you? Yeah. My name is Tori Tausig, and I'm a second year master's student at Fletcher. First of all, thank you all for being here, especially Zainab for missing truffle season. It's very nice of you. <laughs> um, I my, can tell them to invite me next year, please. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So this panel and, and last talked about this connection between academia and policymakers and bridging that gap. My question is, specific, I think it's specific to US foreign policy in particular, but looking at that bridge also between the policymakers and the public, because yeah. regardless of whether or not you're in a huge bureaucratic organization or you're working in Congress or you're working for an administration, your audience and the people you're accountable to is the public. And so when we're all talking about trying to reach these policymakers, they have this huge audience that they are at the end of the day beholden to. And I think in, in the decision making process in foreign policy, so much of it revolves the power of persuasion and getting public will to go along with your ideas. And so I'm wondering in academia, are we are we the ones who are trying to trim the sails and steer a straight course when public will is being blown all over the place? Or are we trying to capture public opinion in our research in order to persuade policymakers? And it's a very, public opinion is very fickle, but it, it certainly requires or at least a role in research because the policymakers are so beholden to it. So I'm wondering how you grapple with that, that fourth part of the square. Well, just to sort of give one example, um, my, my dissertation involved a training on IT fields and how that worked, you know, for uh, low wage workers. And the first, the finding I found was it wasn't a, it wasn't a path to a better jobs because the jobs, the, there just wasn't better jobs. So this was a dissertation. Uh, it was the lack of jobs that was the problem rather than people's lack of skills. And the first thing I did with it was, just as I graduated, there was a State of the Union address where job training was touted as a solution because every president ever, that's all they do all the time, the job training is a solution. And I didn't know any better, so I emailed the Washington Post Outlook editor and said, can I write an op-ed on this saying that this is not gonna work because it never has and never will. I mean, now that I know what I know about media, it was kind of, it was crazy. It's, you don't do that, but I was also, you know, foreign grad student getting used to the U.S. I just didn't know that it wasn't supposed to be done. I published it. That was the first thing I did. Um, and when I was thinking about this, and then we had the discussion with the people I did the research, my sense of it is my duty there is to the public, the people who go to these training programs invest a lot of time. So that was my sense of my responsibility and my contribution to the argument was to say, here's what I have found as an academic uh, looking into that. So defining our public as the people who, just the civic who ultimately is supporting the academy is, you know, in many ways a wonderful life. Um, so if we focus that way, I think it's a better way to think about where to go. Sometimes you go speak to the policymakers, I do when I can. Sometimes you go into the marketplace of ideas, quote unquote, and try to uh, inflect how people think about those things. I just wish we did maybe to go back to it. I, the idea that we would discourage graduate students from trying that is a little upsetting to me. I guess I didn't know better and nobody discouraged me, so maybe I slipped through the cracks, but it worked out. Although, what, I'll, I'll go to Mike, but one of the questions I always have about this is to what extent is our graduate students and junior faculty actively discouraged, and to what extent is this self-censoring? In other words, it's a sense that people sort of read, oh, this would be bad for me, I yeah. probably shouldn't do this. You know, like they might misinterpret, you know, one or two signs and then they, they don't do it themselves, whereas versus sort of an active statement of don't do this. Never been discouraged. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I want to go back to the, uh, the, the public question, and I, I want to uh, pick up on uh, the last thing that Zainab said. I think it, it, it is clearly the case that we, we tend to be elitists, and so when we think about engaging in the policy process, we think about engaging with the executive branch or you know maybe with the legislative branch, uh, and I, I do think that's mostly justifiable in the sense that a lot of the issues we engage are elite politics uh, type <laughs> issues. But you know, I don't think we should uh, overstate that because there are a lot of issues in our bailiwick that are of uh, broader uh, interest to uh, you know the general public, and we ought to be contributing uh, to that in part for educational reasons. But the the thing Zainab said that sort of really resonates with me is the uh, moral obligation. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we have. We, we live great lives uh, as academics, whether we're directly at the public trough like uh, Mia uh, or indirectly at the public trough uh, like me, you know, being at a private university. 
Um, and uh, we have an obligation, it seems to me, to uh, be able to engage the common wheel beyond you know, our own interest in shaping, uh, shaping policy. And it seems to me as being public educators, not only in educating our students, but also you know, contributing to the public debate uh, is an important role we should play. And even if it's not you know, ultimately efficacious, I think there is a moral obligation that we have as citizens that we don't talk very much about. Uh, you know, that I find a little, uh, a little disconcerting. But I, you know, Zainab's absolutely right. We have such privileged lives made possible in, in large measure, whether you're at a public or private university, um, by uh, the support of our fellow citizens, and shouldn't we give something back? Uh, Kelly had her hand up first, so I'm going to her. And actually, given the time, I'm going to like collect a bunch of questions, and then I'll come back to okay. the panel. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to uh, sort of put on the table an idea, um, which is that we consider a little bit more precisely involving policymakers at the front end. I think as academics we often do our research and we come up with findings and then we want to go brief the policymakers and sell those findings. But I had an experience a number of years ago where I had a federal grant and I was instructed to go do consultations with members of Congress. And I had a very instructive meeting with John Dingell who um, pointed out to me that I hadn't thought about and this was about carbon taxation, what, what we were going to do with the revenues. And he said, if you're going to do all this modeling anyway, couldn't you please look at what happens if we did, you know, put that money into Social Security versus, um, I can't remember, he was mostly interested in Social Security, but, you know, a full tax return or something like that. It was a really good idea. And, you know, we did model that. And, and, and it made it much more relevant to him and it, it made him much more likely to accept our results. And I, I just think uh, we often forget to go sort of think about what, you know, ask them uh, for their advice. You don't have to take it, um, but sometimes it can be uh, useful and productive. Um, Peter and then Masso. So I'm struck by a disconnect between the way we do uh, our academic research and then the way we suspend that when it comes time to making a policy recommendation. So the way we do our academic research is we begin by looking at what other academics have done and declare it to be wrong and then set out to prove that it's wrong and produce something that is right until the next graduate student comes along to show that what we just did was wrong. Uh, so there's an built into the academic enterprise is the expectation that you will not have had the last word. However, in much of the discussion, uh, uh, not, not, uh, not so much from Mike, but I, I caught it, I really picked it up from Zainab, is there was an assumption that when I had done this provisional research and reached a provisional conclusion that is right for now, until the next graduate student comes and proves me wrong, I am therefore equipped to tell the policymaker, okay, you must do this, and if you don't do this, uh, you're, it must be because you're biased, because you're craven, because you're bought out by oil in interests or something, because I'm right, at least for now, until the next graduate student comes and shows me that I'm wrong. So why shouldn't we be radically, <laughs> radically more skeptical about our own ability to come up with a, a sort of unshakable policy truth? Exactly. And then they do the same thing. Yes, exactly. Hand the mic behind you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Masab Alaluti, a, a, a Fletcher student. Uh, I just wanted to thank Professor Desh for uh, uh, his comment about graduate students and uh, the ones in the beginning because I'm a graduate student and I'm a first year PhD student. So thank you so much. Uh, my, uh, my question is about the, uh, the advantage that the uh, policymakers have in which they have uh, uh, access to uh, information that the academics don't. That's certainly an, an advantage that, uh, that's not easily uh, addressed because, for an example, they could be 
uh, having uh, a lot of information about Pakistan's nuclear uh, uh, arsenal or program that academics just do not have or do not possess. And they could just be looking at the academic and thinking, what are you talking about? This information that we have yeah. is far away from what you're talking about. So how, how do you address that issue? Um, let's go to the panel, and then I'll come back for one more round. So, Mike, you want to start? Yeah, just uh, quick, Kelly, uh, in, in response to your uh, ex excellent suggestion, I want to propose a Gedankenspiel, a thought experiment. I'm just warning you, you've hit your quota of German words um, <laughs> per panel, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, imagine that uh, the American Political Science Council uh, passed a regulation for the American Political Science Review and mandated quotas in reviewers. And uh, one third of the reviewers for any article that goes out uh, for review for the APSR are non-academics, applied or practitioner political scientists. Imagine what the complexion of the journal would look like. And I would suggest, in fact, uh, we've already run this natural experiment. Up until uh, the early 1960s, the APSR was not peer-reviewed. Uh, the, the institution of peer review, which has many advantages, uh, began, uh, I think, in 1963 or 1964, uh, and look at the difference between the APSR before and after. So um, I'll take on the how are we always right, but we're until the next grad student one. It is a kind of interesting thing. I guess it comes into the next panel bit of being sort of the work of there's a great Laurie Anderson, so it takes an expert. Um, just uh, if you ever find it on YouTube, it's awesome. Um, the work of being a pundit, sort of the cultural con construction of expertise, always implies certainty, which, of course, the great truth, as we all know, is that the, our knowledge is like what we can even know is limited. So that's very true. And I think one fix to that is the social media engagement style which I've kind of come to expect from uh, my work is that as soon as I write something, people show up to tell me I'm wrong. I mean, there's like, you know, that's a millisecond thing. And of course, some of it is I disagree with, but I have often been challenged really interesting ways by taking my work out of the peer-reviewed journal and just putting it out there. And there's now a peer-reviewed a journal in sociology, yes, called Sociological Science with um, one week or two week turnaround, up or down. You don't get detailed reviews, you just get published or not. But once you get published, it's open to a comment system. And there's a paper published arguing with a paper of mine and I immediately went and you know, put a comment on it and then I went and had coffee with one of the authors who I hadn't known before and then we hashed it out more and then they came back. And that was such, that's such an interesting experiment. It's peer reviewed, it's very rigorous. Um, it's not gonna wait three years. You either go someplace else or you're published. They're not gonna nitpick over, please add this, please add that, uh, the way you, you know, end up having to please reviewer number two till you know, kingdom come and it doesn't work. Um, but then you go back in the comments and hash it out. I think there's these things we can do which both make visible to the public that you know we don't have these perfect answers and also take it to blogs and comments. There's challenges there. I mean, you write on a politically con conservative, uh, controversial topic and there's a lot of issues. There are issues with being a women in public. But on the other hand, there's so many benefits to looking at this conversation as a conversation. You can't totally get away from the construction of expertise as the know-it-all. Uh, but I think there are great methods of trying to counter that a little bit. And sociological science, I'm so excited about it. It's founded by top uh, you know, professors from different uh, departments. And I think other fields should do that because it's very hard for the untenured to lead these efforts. Mm -hmm. We do have the job, keep the job issue. So, but the tenured people can do this. You know, then I, I wish there was more experiments like that in other fields. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, so great that it, some people, you know, there, there's a, a group of us in this room that have talked about trying to create a, a sort of international relations or political science journal that Thanks. does sort of exactly that. And I think one hope is that uh, Eric Bowden et al.'s new, of which I now sort of collaborate a bit, and I think several people in this room uh, do, uh, research in politics, 
might might accomplish some of that with sort of rapid rapid. I mean, that journal has less of an influence emphasis maybe on, on policy relevance per se, but sort of rapid turnaround of work that is sort of shorter, also, but also rigorous, relevant to the public, uh, I think to public policy issues. I think there's a, a great space for that, and I think that would help incentivize, and you, by making it peer reviewed, you can incentivize more scholars to sort of play ball in that uh, arena. And then just, just one quick point, I, I think we should all be eating humble pie when it comes to our policy recommendations, mm -hmm. that yeah. in some ways as difficult as it is, to identify trends that are no kidding actually going on in the world. I think it's harder to figure out policies that will no kidding yeah. move those trends, and which is what, what policy making uh, a sort of is. And, and that's something I've always kind of known, but was definitely brought home, I, I think, in the, the year I spent uh, in the government in, in understanding that you know, you, you know, it's easy on the outside to be like, hey, why isn't the US government or why isn't whatever government like doing like policy X, they must be idiots. They're totally not idiots. Yeah. In fact, there's a really smart, high-ranking person that's probably like 99% chance has had the exact same idea as you, but they can't get it done. And it might be because it turns out when you get on the inside, the information is different. Uh, or it might be that there's a bureaucratic barrier to it, and so it just, it just can't get done. And so I, I, I think humbleness in our policy recommendations, and especially in our uh, understanding of why uh, governments uh, are or are not doing particular things is, is, is you know, nearly always warranted. Okay, we got one more round of uh, questions. I think I had Aaron, Mia, and student in the back. And then I think that's all we got time for, frankly. So just to follow up on Mike's Wait for the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just to follow up on Mike's last point, um, and Mike actually made an interesting point earlier. I think we probably talked about it a bit yesterday, which was um, you know, these sort of halcyon, halberstam days of, you know, policy academic interaction um, come from a time where, you know, wealthy white men went to Andover, who then went to Yale and Harvard, who then went to, you know, the Defense Department, CIA, and then back to Harvard. Um, and that's, that's a very interesting um, both class argument, but also a network argument. These people knew each other, and that's, that's an interesting piece that matters. I mean, it, it's why... Aaron, I'm glad you're calling for more white men to, you know, finally, as a way to <laughs> deal with, with greater, you as know, As long as I get to choose relevance. them, Dan, it'll, <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, but the point that I wanted to follow up that Mike raised more recently is this question, um, we've talked about professionalization within the academy, but part of that best and brightest, a terrible term that was used ironically even at the time, um, was the professionalization of the Defense Department and other parts of the government mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. Mike obviously has had the most recent experience you know, with this. Others in the room have served, um, whether through the fellowships of the Council on Foreign Relations or other exchanges. Um, but I think that that's, it's interesting to, to, to reflect on as well. How do you engage in the policy process when that process is not just idiosyncratic, but incredibly dense? And credit requires a fair amount of expert knowledge such that their entire ranks, the principal deputy positions within the Defense Department, that are dedicated to knowing the building, right? That's almost quite literally their, their job. So how do we think about the dual professionalization of both the government side and, and the policy side as we try to engage more directly? That's a great question. Uh, Mia? I just want to reiterate and, and maybe sort of although he doesn't need my validation, but validate something that Mike said with regard to the students. I think that part of the problem, you know, as we talk about why the government may not be paying attention to us as academics, I think part of the problem is the metrics that we are using against ourselves in terms of measuring our success. So there are departments, and I'm not going to name names, that look at the students that choose not to become academics as those are failures. So when they are ranking that department, and that's not just in political science, that could also be in psychology, which is another department that I'm very familiar with, that people who choose to go in the business, they no longer count them in terms of their own metrics in their standings and their rankings. So part of what we're discussing here is perhaps a reformation of the way in which we see ourselves and the way in which we project our own rankings and maybe we have some influ influence on the NRC or on other US News and World Report rankings. But I think it's really important that for me at least, and again, I work on a subject that might be uh, have more applied relevance than others, that most of my students who have gone into USAID, who have gone into the government, who've gone into various alphabetical agencies, those are my bridges. Those are the ways in which I've had the most influence where those students sit in the room and they're no longer students now and they're making considerably more money than any other professors, which is fabulous. And they're sitting there going, well, I don't know if it's only about occupation. 
let me tell you about some stuff I studied and something I learned. And I want to go to the gentleman's question here that really he didn't get a response to. I can tell you that unless you're talking about Pakistani nuclear proliferation, a lot of the stuff that is considered for you and classified and you know you need every level of clearance isn't necessarily of higher quality than the open source work that is being done in various fields and the kind of stuff that you guys can all do in the room will be of equal quality as long as you apply the rigor and the standards and sort of inspired by the theor theoretical greatness of the people who are sitting around me at these tables. Uh, I'm Neeraj Prasad. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm a second year PhD student. Uh, so at any given time, uh, depending upon what's in vogue, policy makers have a certain bias for certain types of questions, research, and even certain type of answers. So if academia were to cater to this demand by tailor tailoring their own research questions and uh, answers, isn't there a certain implicit co-option? OK, uh, I'm going to have the panelists answer in, res in the same order that we originally presented. So Mike, you have anything to? Yeah, just quickly to Aaron's point. I, I mean, I think the, the part of the problem of the gap is a, uh, a larger set of sociological developments. I mean, I've sort of hammered on uh, uh, the academy and what's going on in the ivory tower. But you're absolutely right. A lot has changed in the, uh, the nature of uh, the US government and inside the beltway over the past 50 years. The explosion of the bureaucracy, the construction of in-house sources of uh, intellectual capital, uh, the conversion of uh, think tanks from you know, being transmission belts at one time. You know, Brookings Institution was established in the 1920s as a transmission belt into Washington. Uh, from uh, you know uh, the work that was being done primarily but not exclusively uh, in a lot of other in universities uh, outside Washington that's changed uh, uh, mostly for worse in recent years and the final change we haven't talked a lot about but it is interesting to me and I don't claim to fully understand it is the change in public attitudes towards the professoriate as a source of independent expertise. There was a time, and I don't think I'm romanticizing this, where uh, James Conant, who was president of Harvard, was a national public intellectual on you know, a, a variety of issues that he had uh, expertise in. When is the last time, except maybe Leon Botstein and music, uh, that a uh, university president was regarded as a, uh, a source of public wisdom on anything other than fundraising. And, and I would suggest that there are very few instances of that. You could argue it was Larry Summers, as Aaron said, but that didn't end well, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just one more data point on that, that um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe um, try to burst Mike's bubble a little bit on the romanticism. And uh, recall that when the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariff was being debated, uh, but, you know, at the onset of the Great Depression, that there was a letter written by, uh, signed by a thousand economists, urging, urging all members of Congress to vote against the, the Smoot-Hawley tariff. And of course, you see how much influence they had. Yeah, well, that, that's the selection effect. It was economists. But. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that uh, I think the, I actually think the student issue is really important. It's it, from, a, from a networking perspective. The, uh, at given, our PhD program is so small that we just don't have that many people. And so for us, that tends to happen through our, our undergraduates more than through our, our PhD students. But I think that's a, a, a hugely, hugely useful transmission mechanism because I think as all of us know that, I mean, in some ways what we're, what we're talking about, we're, we're kind of dancing around or, or the formal mechanisms, whether it's through, I mean, in, by, and I'm including formal as sort of tweeting and blogging. Uh, formal mechanisms through which you, know, you say something in the public sphere and then that influences the policy world. We spent very little time talking about the, but the much more expensive, much deeper informal mechanisms through which sort of academics and others influence the policy world, which is essentially through social networks. And that, you know, as we all know, you know offline, social networks. offline social networks no, no, no. Is, is sort of, for example, as, as many people know, uh, academics are brought into state and DOD and other places all the time to talk with fairly high-level policymakers about 
sort of various issues. And those things aren't necessarily publicized, and that doesn't show up on somebody's CV. And some of those academics are not people that we would think about as necessarily policy-relevant scholars. But those are you know, sort of more examples of engagement that speak to sort of informal, offline social networks, which I think are also very important. You, can, you don't put that on your CV? <laughs> no, and and the, the, the fact that people are sort of laughing about it is funny because, you know, again, I'm an academic bureaucrat. And uh, when we evaluate uh, our faculty, uh, we have all sorts of different criteria for service, including public service. Um, and, you know, it, it, if one of my faculty were regularly consulting uh, with government, in addition to uh, other things, and I have faculty, believe it or not, who do that, I want to see it on their CV, and I'm going to give them credit for it. Uh, but I, I suspect that a lot of people wouldn't do this, and the reason they wouldn't, uh, I, you know, would bear some consideration. But part of the reason you wouldn't is maybe the co-optation question, because if yeah. you did, you wouldn't get invited back. Discretion is important. The discretion discretion does matter. I mean, it also depends whether you like you're saying this to be chair versus whether you actually have it on a CV that you can access it publicly. All right, Zainab, I'll finish. You are the only thing standing between us and lunch. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm just gonna sort of. It's true, like that. You know, knowing something, it's very hard. Moving policy, it's all very hard. But I want to sort of emphasize what uh, people were saying. Like, I take pretty much all calls coming from people in some bureaucracy, some government, some way, who are like, can we talk, can we pick your brain on this for a while? And it really doesn't always show up on my CV. In fact, it rarely shows up on my CV because it's some congressional committee staff who is gonna run a meeting, and I give them an hour of my time. I mean, it kind of goes with this moral obligation thing. Um, it's not something I do expecting something. In fact, I try not to expect something so that I can keep my independence. I also take calls from students, former students who are now in the world, and I, and I, my, my university now has public engagement as a separate category of tenure evaluation. It's not just that I'm on the undergraduate committee, it's that I have New York Times op-eds that is formally evaluated, which is yay. But there's a part of the work I do, just the way we spend our time with our students, and we don't really expect you know, pats on the back because it's the rewarding part of the work and it's your obligation. I think we should just encourage that professionally. In the professions, yes, metrics matter, but the culture matters. And yeah, you can't always put it on your CV. Sometimes people really just want to pick your brain and then go run with it. And sometimes you know, I'm plagiarized in policy documents. I'm like, yay. You know, go for it. This is why I write. Um, just, just the cultural change is good too. And lunch, also well, good. I'd like to thank everyone here for participating. I would close with one slight contrary note to what Zainab said, which is I also think as you know, academics, we also occasionally have to encourage to say no when someone is asking us for policy advice. <laughs> Not because we don't want to be co-opted, but because we don't know us that much. I, there have been times where I've been asked to consult or, or you know, talk to a reporter or what have you about something. And I don't, yeah, this is don't not know, my area yeah. of expertise. I don't know how they got my name, you know, wh whatever. And you, I've got, you've got to learn to say no to those things on occasion. Sure, um, but that said, I'd like to thank the panel, and uh, we will now break for lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.